I'm Zoe Hawkins and I'm here today with Dr. Mark Mabry, Chief Security Officer and Vice President of the Minor Corporation. Um, Dr. Mabry, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Pleasure to have you. Um, so in your sort of extensive career, um, both in MITRE, previously as the Chief Technology Officer as well, and as the um, Chief Scientist of the US Air Force, you've obviously dealt quite a lot with emerging technologies. And um, when we are here at ASPE, we talk about cybersecurity, often um, the challenge can seem a little bit overwhelming. Um, I'm just wondering if any of the work you've seen on emerging technologies should give us any hope for that challenge getting a bit easier. Well, uh, Zoe, I think it's a great question, uh, you know, and, and obviously we immediately race to technology as a solution, but let me just start by saying the greatest technology we have are human beings. And uh, it, it's really, uh, cybersecurity is very much a human domain, so it's very important for us to appreciate that, that the innovation that's going to happen, both uh, from the adversary as well as the defenders, will come from humans. But having said that, uh, there are lots of exciting technologies that, that, are, that are emerging. Uh, they include new technologies for sensors, a lot of machine learning technology coming from my own background actually. Uh, artificial intelligence is now finding its way uh, to helping detect threats, also helping to automatically uh, c uh, counter threats. Uh, so there's a lots of uh, new, new uh, interesting technology also in situational awareness. Um, how can you actually see things and e even pr pr predict what's likely to occur? and then hopefully prevent that from occurring. So lots of exciting technologies. Well, that's good news to hear. And, and I'm interested by you mentioning you know, um, artificial intelligence being used to improve situational awareness and potentially countering offensive actions by, by malicious cyber actors. Do you think that that eventually could actually sway what is currently seen as a, uh, in the offense-defense balance in cyberspace being very much favorable to, to an attacker? Do you think that artificial intelligence could, could improve the defensive posturing? Well, intelligent machines uh, can be used for good or bad. Uh, and so uh, part of it, it's, it's up to the humans uh, leveraging those systems. Um, so in, in my personal view, I don't believe that actually there's a particular advantage to the uh, offense or defense from the use of machine learning. And mm -hmm. let, me, let me explain. Um, while it's true that, that an offender could use it to, for example, automatically detect vulnerabilities uh, in an, an actual target system, and for sure, just because of the nature of computer science and the complexity of systems uh, that are developed today, uh, there are lots of interdependencies. It's quite easy um, to detect a vulnerability. At the same time, defenders today now can automatically detect a, police, a, p a piece of malicious code very rapidly. Um, we can automatically detect uh, and look, consider what countermeasures might actually maximally uh, yield the benefit. So it really comes down to how clever are, are the, is the offense and defense in using those systems to actually help them perform better, either at perception or at reasoning and thinking about how to respond or actually the response itself. Mm, I think that's it's interesting because it sort of touches on that dual use of technology and how it can be used both to help um, the attacker and the defender, right. uh, depending how it's applied. And you know, I think you're sort of speaking to it not being necessarily a revolutionary change because it's probably going to um, advantage um, both sides of the fight. And talking about your experience with, with the Air Force um, and the emerging technologies that they're seeing around maybe hypersonics or lethal autonomous weapon systems, um, do you see any of that being a sort of revolutionary change in the nature of warfare? Um, I, you know, w warfare, as uh, you know, Clausewitz said, is just you know, a, a, a politics by another means. Uh, for sure, it's the case that uh, that hypersonics wep weapons will make things happen faster, um, and so we'll have to think at the speed uh, in, in e even weapons like um, directed energy weapons. You know, thinking and, and acting at the speed of light. Uh, so for sure, things will be more quick, more quickly occurring. Although in cyber uh, security, things happen in, in milliseconds and nanoseconds sometimes. So speed is not really a new dimension uh, in cyber security. Uh, but there are actually particularly challenging aspects in, in, in cyber and some of these new, if you will, methods of, of, of activity. One of them is uh, adversaries have discovered that uh, unlike uh, kinetic warfare, uh, cyber warfare is uh, oftentimes much easier to acquire, so the, the barriers to entry are much more limited. Uh, also, the uses uh, are much more uh, sophisticated in the sense that one can actually um, uh, apply partially or even reversibly a method. Uh, and so in that case, some adversaries uh, find them very appealing because they can stay below the threshold of a full engagement. Um, that's actually more dangerous because it means there's more propensity to use these methods. Uh, but it's also the case that there are other challenges like attribution. Uh, who did it? 
Um, well, deception is part of this realm. As I mentioned uh, you know, before, this is a human domain. Uh, and humans are particularly great at deception. Uh, and this is just another means, another media, another domain through which those kinds of actions can pursue. So it, it absolutely is changing the nature of some aspects uh, of, of conflict. But in other cases, it's just the same old conflict. That More, of the same. <laughs> More of the same. More of the same. I want to pick up on the concept you use about thresholds and obviously cyberspace often being talked about one that's more accessible to, to less powerful actors, for example. Yes. Um, we talk about um, space technology. That's obviously very different. That's something that has a very high threshold of, of entry. Um, how do you think the interplay between those two things will affect um, power play. So can, can cyber operations compromise space-based technology? Is that a threat we should be considering? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the cybersecurity uh, and, and general information technology is in almost everything we have. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to find a, a particular area of, uh, of, of commerce or area of activity from learning uh, to, to, uh, to, to exercise today, mm -hmm. uh, to health, uh, to certainly warfare in systems where cyber hasn't touched it. And space is no different. Um, you know, space, uh, you know, when we look at space generally, it has uh, both a ground segment, uh, it has a launch segment, it's, there's the actual, mm -hmm. you know, operations in space, and then of course we have the user segment. Uh, people like yourself, myself, are using GPS or other space-based services. Remote sensing even, right? Images of, of, our, of our farms or images of our businesses or our trucks and so on. So space has actually uh, got a very, very large attack surface. Um, not only the classical attacks from supply chain, uh, attacks from the, the actual insiders as well, uh, but across all of these areas of, of dimension. So um, for sure, uh, space is dependent on cyber uh, and vice versa. There are cyber capabilities that are dependent on space. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's also the case that um, that we need to appreciate the complexity of these systems and interdependencies so that we can make them more resilient. And that's one of the things we've been doing at MITRE is actually helping create methods uh, for increasing resilience across all these domains. Mm. Well, that's very important. And I think, um, again, we're speaking about sort of the work you're doing in MITRE in, in the U.S. And do you think that Australia, as they move towards trying to focus on some of these um, technological developments, are there particular areas that the U.S. and Australia should maybe collaborate on? Um, Absolutely. Um, uh, so at the, at the broad uh, area, you know, Australia has, has some particularly uh, strengths uh, because of the nature of its, of its economy and the nature of the scientific investments it's made. Um, obviously, there are areas of strength like mining. Uh, actually, autonomy and mining is, is, is a great area. I had, had a great pleasure of uh, spending time uh, at your port of Brisbane, which is the most automated uh, port in the world in terms of the largest robots. Um, and I, I mean, I'm shorter than the wheels on the robots. Uh, it's a very impressive place. Um, uh, there, are, there are other areas like hypersonics and, and other technologies uh, where, where a lot of innovation has occurred. So I think, I think the, the right uh, method of collaboration is to find those areas where Australia has a great strength and where the U.S. has a great need and look at those, those partnerships. Uh, there are many, many possibilities. I'm actually the director of the uh, National Cybersecurity Federally Funded Research and Development Center in, in, in the U.S. And we support the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. And our principal job is to work in industrial sectors and protect them. Um, which is a very interesting and, and challenging uh, a job. We have, we have, uh, we have uh, cooperative research and development agreements with, with, with over 100 uh, commercial companies within the United States. There's no reason why that, the, the capabilities we create, the protection guides that we create can't be used here in Australia or can't be extended in Australia. For example, in the, the mining industry as an example in autonomous operations. So I think there's some great opportunities for partnership and that's one of the reasons why I'm here in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of partnership opportunities and um, a lot of lessons to be learned by the sounds of it. And some of the work absolutely. that you mentioned that MITRE does obviously is promoting um, the establishment of information sharing uh, networks on cyber threats in yes. the United States. Yes. Um, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre recently released a, um, a cybersecurity um, survey uh, on the anniversary of um, our cybersecurity strategy, which actually revealed an interesting um, statistic, which was su survey participants, um, when ranking factors of cybersecurity, actually put information sharing, put of nine out of ten um, in importance of, of multiple factors. How do you overcome, um, I guess, that perception of, val of um, of the value required to be put in to get value out of something like that? Well, that's an excellent uh, question. Um, you know, we, we have the, uh, the honor of, of being the first in, in several areas in the United States. Uh, we, we, are, we are actually, few people know we're the first .org in the world. 
uh, MITRE.ORG was actually created. Uh, we've been working on the establishment of the Internet since its creation and its, its security. Um, there's no better information sharing mechanism in the world than the Internet. <laughs> um, so uh, we realized very early on the importance of, of securing that. Um, we've been, we were honored in 2014 to become the first national cybersecurity FFRDC. Interestingly, before we actually had uh, laws and, and legislation in the United States for what we call information sharing and analysis organizations, ISAOs, mm -hmm. which gets to your question, Zoe, um, is we might or actually work together with the Federal Reserve, with universities like MIT and Harvard, uh, with uh, biotech companies, financial services companies, other defense companies, to create a organization, a public-private partnership for cyber information sharing. Uh, we started this in Massachusetts. It grew to a number of companies that are more nationally uh, based. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we did a survey uh, after uh, creating this organization, this public-private partnership, about eight years ago. Uh, we, start, we started creating it within, within MITRE, and then we actually established it about seven years ago. So we've been operating for a couple of years. And uh, what we primarily do is share threat information. Uh, so, for example, if we MITRE see an adversary, we'll alert the members of our network to, to say, hey, look, we're seeing this particular vector of attack. Um, we think you could be vulnerable. But what's interesting about, about this, uh, what's called the Advanced uh, Cybersecurity Center, uh, is this public-private partnership is built exclusively to share information. Uh, and so what we're able to do is do this across sector, so that if we some, see something in defense, we can warn the banks or the Federal Reserve. If the high-tech companies see something, they can warn the universities. So basically, that kind of threat sharing allows you to get ahead of the threat before, it, if it attacks me, I want you to know about it before it hits you and vice versa. Uh, we recently surveyed our members. 89% of our members said they got actionable intelligence from our information sharing network. What that means is that uh, when we have Cyber Tuesdays and our, our chief information security officers chat about what's going to happen in the future, um, we, within the same week, are able to put countermeasures within our systems to protect either better detection, because we're, we're waiting for the threat, we know they're coming, uh, or actual mechanisms to block the threat. Um, that has actually helped uh, secure us. So you're absolutely right. People can't appreciate what they can't see. Mm. That's one of the challenges. Why is it 9 out of 10 in your survey? I'm not surprised. Um, they also can't appreciate what uh, they need until after they need it. And so it's kind of like you know when, you're, when your parents tell you, brush your teeth, <laughs> sleep well, you know, exercise, right? You don't know why you should do that until you spent half a century on the planet and you realize, I'm glad I took care of myself because now I'm in better shape. We want the same thing for cybersecurity, taking care of ourselves to prevent these challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe presenting the success stories of some of those um, networks in the U.S. might be a way to make that value proposition to absolutely. Australian companies. And, and the ISAOs and the ISACs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, have actually bloomed. We have dozens of them in the United States now across, you know, within particular sectors, communications, uh, uh, in, in the, the, the uh, energy sector, financial sector, and so on, uh, but also across sectors, uh, regional uh, threat sharing uh, activity. So, for example, the governor of Virginia has just recently asked us to set up what's called the Mid-Atlantic Cybersecurity Consortium. Because of our success in the Northeast, we want to move it down uh, to the greater Washington area to protect those uh, cross-sector uh, activities as well. Fantastic. And I think just to bring it back to the beginning where you started is very much cybersecurity is also a human a human problem as much as technology. Much so. um, obviously, to do a lot of these things we've spoken about, um, you know, you need the workforce and the skilled um, people to do it. Um, are there any lessons that Australia can learn from the United States in terms of getting a sufficient number of people trained in, in these areas? Yeah, let me uh, mention two specific things. I would just mentioned uh, Governor, Governor McAuliffe. He did an interesting thing. He did an economic analysis, and he found that he had so many unfilled cyber positions, you have this experience mm. here too, um, that he actually started taking uh, uh, public funds and investing for two years to actually get, get individuals certified, so to get more professionals into cybersecurity. He found that within two years, because of the increased uh, employment rates, and the tax generations, that investment would pay back. Uh, so we need people to look economically at the, the economic loss from not actually filling these positions, apart from the fact that it makes these companies more vulnerable if they don't have the right cyber defenders working. Uh, the second point is we've taken uh, initiative to actually try to encourage uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics investment, the STEM investment, particularly in cybersecurity. 
Um, one of the things we do at MITRE is we run with about half a dozen universities. Uh, we just had a major event uh, uh, that culminated in what we call embedded capture the flag. So we basically have groups of university students working with professors, um, attacking one another, in this case, an embedded system. So think systems like the space systems you were talking about. They have a lot of cyber on board. Cars have, you know, hundreds, of, you know, tens, sometimes hundred million lines of code. Very vulnerable. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll get students to actually take parts of those and attack and defend. And so you excite them, they, they get excited. The one final thing that we need to work more on, and you'll appreciate this always, we need to get more women into computing. Uh, I've gotten, our, my wife and I have gotten our two sons into computing. <laughs> uh, we haven't quite convinced our daughter to get into computing, although she's, she'll be a scientist. Um, and I suspect someday she'll be exposed to computing. She, you know, she'll may, maybe get excited by it. But we need more women and more diversity as well. So I think um, we, we need to get more talent. Uh, we need to excite them and, and you know, via, via some of these uh, interesting, innovative mm -hmm. things like embedded capture the flag. Uh, and I can tell you, just having come back from the event in the United States, um, the students are so jazzed. I mean, they just love and get really motivated by the by these kinds of activities. We need to do it down in high school and even before that, because we know that children, even as young as three and four years old, they're affected by the language and the science that they're that they're exposed to. So we need to encourage that full uh, sort of connection all the way up to the professions. Yeah, absolutely. I think Australia is trying to do a bit of that work in terms of bringing those skill sets up in through primary school and into high school too. So that's Excellent. definitely part of the national innovation and science agenda here. But I think it definitely speaks to the fact that cybersecurity is not a problem that's going to go away overnight. And we need to take the same long-term view that we take in terms of investing in defense technology that goes sort of over decades of planning um, to the to the human resources that need are needed to sort of back up that industry as well. Absolutely. A bit Zoe. of foresight. Absolutely. Um, and, and to your point, Zoe, by the way, in terms of it'll be here forever. We talk about embedded systems, right? They're gonna literally be embedded in us, right? Yeah. We have people who have you know, uh, you know, heart monitors and we're gonna have brain implants, uh, we're gonna have visual, we already, already, already have uh, abilities to augment our hearing. Um, all of these are gonna be cyber physical devices. And so you know, these are gonna be more and more of our future not less, and so we need more talent. Yep. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely, well, lots to look forward to. Um, Dr. Mabry, thank you so much for joining us today. For thank you so much, Zoe, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.